The rocky hill was steep, and the day was cloudless and hot. A middle-aged man and his teenage son walked slowly up the slope, each carrying a loaded basket. At the top of this hill was a cave, where they were camped with other members of their band, 23 men, women, and children. Their group came here a few times every year. The cave provided good shelter from the wind and sun, and from the top of the hill, they could spot herds of gazelle in the distance. By modern standards, their appearance was odd. Low foreheads, big faces, and thick brows above their eyes. Yet, the tired expression on the older man's face would look familiar to us. Although fatigued from a long walk, he was happy because he was returning with a very valuable stone, chert, excellent for making spear points. He had broken a point during his last hunt and needed to make a new one. The method he would use to craft his new spear had only been used here in the Maghreb of northwestern Africa for a few generations. Reaching the summit of the hill, they could see the mouth of the cave. Curious children ran out to see what they had in their baskets. The man purposely picked up a piece of chert he had brought back with him. It was a gray disc-shaped stone about the size of his hand. He sat down in the shade of the cave, placed the chert in his lap, and using a round hammer stone, started tapping the edge of the chert. As he did this, small bits of rock fell to the ground by his feet. As he shaped the stone, he carefully examined its surface, closely calculating each angle and convexity. He had learned this process from his elders, and it had taken him years to master. His son watched his progress closely. After several minutes of preparation, he struck the final blow. With a single, forceful, accurate strike, he separated a flake that ran the length of the stone and that had two long, sharp edges on either side that met in a point. He examined its thickness and sharpness carefully and was satisfied. The use of this particular type of stone tool is an archaeological signature that marks the appearance of the earliest members of our species 300,000 years ago. The complexity involved in the manufacture of these points reveals an emerging level of intelligence. While these people may not quite have looked like us, they were starting to think like modern humans. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 3, Dawn of the Middle Stone Age. In our last episode, we examined the genetic and fossil evidence that modern humans evolved in Africa. During the period known as the Middle Stone Age, from 300,000 to 40,000 years ago, early Homo sapiens displayed a mixture of modern and archaic physical traits. Based on the fossil record, we know that during this period they lived across the African continent and occasionally in the Levant. Genetic studies tell us that our ancestors in the Middle Stone Age experienced periods of geographic expansion as well as phases of population isolation as the climate fluctuated from dry ice ages to wet interglacials. In today's episode, we will turn to the archaeological record from the Middle Stone Age to see what it can tell us about early Homo sapiens. The objects that these people left behind provide insight into their technology, survival strategies, and social interactions. Whereas in the last episode we focused on the genetic and anatomical beginning of modern humans, in this episode we will explore the cognitive and behavioral origins of our species. Since we are dealing with such an old period, very few objects these people used have survived to be dug up by archaeologists. 
This means that the information we have about the Middle Stone Age comes almost entirely from two types of materials which can resist the ravages of time, stones and bones. As we discuss prehistoric archaeology in the upcoming episodes, we must keep in mind that stone tools only represent a small part of the material exploited by ancient people. As with modern-day foragers, much of the equipment prehistoric people used in their daily life was probably made up of organic material, which decays quickly. While archaeologists can extract an amazing amount of information from stone tools, we should keep in mind that prehistoric cultures were much more than this one aspect of their technology. Around 300,000 years ago, hominins start using stone tools differently than they had before. In fact, the Middle Stone Age, as with other archaeological periods, is defined by its material remains, not by fossils or genetics. Archaeologists have divided the Stone Age of Africa into early, middle, and late based on the type of stone tools used during each period. So what type of tool defines the Middle Stone Age? The short answer is points, which are thin flakes of stone about 5 centimeters long made in different shapes with a sharp point at one end. They are the most characteristic tool of the Middle Stone Age found at many sites from this period, although they appear alongside many other kinds of tools. These points were probably used at the end of hunting weapons, like spears. But evidence from use wear, which are the microscopic scratches on the surface of an object, shows that they were also used for cutting. Points were rare before 300,000 years ago, and in Africa were replaced by other kinds of tools about 40,000 years ago. But the Middle Stone Age is not only marked by the presence of points, but also by a fundamental change in the method of making stone tools. During this period, hominins gradually stop using an older form of stone tool called a shulian. These were large cutting tools made mostly by Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis by chipping flakes off a core stone with a hammer stone until the core had the desired shape of a tool. The archetypal Acheulean tool is the hand axe, a teardrop shaped stone with flakes removed all the way around the edge and often more than 10 centimeters long. They were designed to be held directly in the hand and were probably used to butcher animal carcasses among other tasks. These tools are found in large numbers across Africa, Europe, and Western Asia. As hominins in Africa stop using these large cutting tools, they start making smaller tools using a series of methods called prepared core technologies. Prepared cores are ingenious. Instead of shaping the core stone, as with Acheulean tools, prepared core methods use the flakes that come off the core as the tools themselves. In order to obtain the desired tool, the crafter must prepare the core stone by removing small flakes to shape its surface prior to a final strike that releases the larger tool flake. This is the process I described in the opening scene. Prepared cores create thinner, sharper tools and allow for a larger variety of shapes, depending on the way the core is prepared. One well-known way of preparing a core is called the Levallois Technique. The Levallois Technique can be used to make oval, rectangular, and triangular tools, and comes into common use during the Middle Stone Age. The replacement of large Acheulean by small flake tools was a gradual process. In some cases, both types are found in the same layers of archaeological sites. In fact, Levallois technology was invented at least by 400,000 years ago in Africa, and tools made with this technique are found sporadically among otherwise Acheulean tools. As the early Stone Age transitions to the Middle Stone Age, Levallois cores become much more common and widespread, and Acheulean hand axes and other large cutting tools become rare. So it took a long time from the first invention of prepared cores until their widespread adoption as the main tool-making approach. 
It is the appearance of archaeological sites where hominin groups completely abandon large cutting tools that mark the beginning of the Middle Stone Age. So why did hominins start using a whole new set of tools after hundreds of thousands of years of using Acheulean hand axes? It may be that they were finally becoming smart enough to innovate new technologies. Let's remember from our last episode that about 300,000 years ago, early Homo sapiens first appeared based on the fossil record. That is roughly the same time that prepared cores are becoming widespread in Africa. This has led many archaeologists to suggest that these developments in stone tool technology are the result of greater intelligence in early Homo sapiens populations than among more archaic hominins. Two features of prepared core tools suggest an increase in intelligence during the Middle Stone Age. First, prepared core technology allows the toolmaker to effectively predetermine the shape of a flake. But the series of steps to accomplish this required a more sophisticated way of thinking than with Acheulean tools, because the initial steps of preparing the core do not lead intuitively to the final product. In other words, it requires planning and a working memory. The second feature is the size of the tools. As opposed to the larger Acheulean tools, the newer, smaller ones were more difficult to use when held directly in the hand. In fact, the development of these small tools is believed to coincide with the first widespread use of hafted tools, which are attached to handles made of wood or bone. This conclusion is based on careful analysis of modifications made to the shape of points after being removed from the core, which seem to indicate that they were altered to facilitate the attachment to a handle. Also, studies of use wear on edges suggest repeated contact of the stones with other surfaces, such as a handle. The construction of composite tools made of multiple components, such as a stone knife with a wooden handle, not only would have allowed humans to make better tools, but also demonstrates an advance in intelligence. So a key question we now have to answer is, were early Homo sapiens the hominins using prepared cores and points in Africa? We should keep in mind that during this broad transitional period, 400 to 200,000 years ago, early Homo sapiens were probably sharing the continent with other tool-using hominins such as Homo heidelbergensis and Homo naledi. Unfortunately, the fossil record is so sparse that it's difficult to make definitive conclusions about which hominin was responsible for making which type of tool. African archaeological sites with early Homo sapiens fossils have been found with both prepared core and Acheulean tools. For example, the Herto skull, one of the Kenyan skulls that had a rounded shape, was found with Acheulean tools, whereas other skeletons of early Homo sapiens were found next to prepared cores, such as those at Jebel Irhud, Florisbad, and Omo. It may be that some groups of Homo sapiens were adopting the prepared core technology more quickly than others. Or perhaps they were switching between these two technologies to suit the needs of their environment. For other hominid species, we have little evidence during the Middle Stone Age. The few Homo heidelbergensis fossils from Africa have only been found with Acheulean tools, no prepared cores or points. Therefore, many archaeologists argue that early Homo sapiens were the main species of hominin using Middle Stone Age tools. Since we're pretty sure that prepared cores and points reflect the emergence of our species, we can now ask where in Africa these tools have been found, and by extension, where early Homo sapiens were living something which is difficult to determine based solely on the limited skeletal remains. Stone tools are much more common than early Homo sapiens bones. So let's take a tour of the beginning of Middle Stone Age Africa. This journey will not only reveal the geographic extent of early Homo sapiens, 
but will also provide clues about why they adopted such different stone tools and what this tells us about their life. Some of the oldest Middle Stone Age tools were found at Jebel Irhud Cave in Morocco, next to fossils of early Homo sapiens. These are the same fossils we talked about last episode that had modern-looking faces and were dated to 315,000 years ago. Acheulean tools were completely absent among the artifacts found here, and about a quarter of the stone flakes found near the fossils were made with the Levallois technique. The tools range in size from 4 to 8 centimeters long, smaller than Acheulean tools. Some were classified by archaeologists as points, but the majority are a type called scrapers, which are tools with tiny flakes removed along one side in order to sharpen it. As their name suggests, these tools could have been used for scraping meat away from animal hides during the butchering process, but they probably served a range of functions, including cutting. Most of the tools at Jebel Irhud were made from a special type of rock called flint. Flint falls into a category of rocks called fine-grained, which break easily and with sharp edges. This makes fine-grained stones ideal for tool making. So early Homo sapiens living in this cave recognized the value of flint and selected it over more abundant rocks, like quartz. Alongside stone tools and human bones, in the same archaeological layer, evidence of fire and hunting are present. Animal bones with cut marks indicating butchery with stone tools were found in large numbers and many of them were burnt. The majority are from gazelle, suggesting that this was the favored prey of these foragers. Bones of larger mammals like zebra, wildebeest, and oryx are also found in the cave but in lower numbers. The preference for gazelle may suggest that these people found it less dangerous to hunt this smaller species. Or maybe it was simply the most abundant animal in the region. What we do know is that these groups of early Homo sapiens were skilled stone tool makers and hunters who transported their prey back to this cave to cook it and eat it. While Jebel Irhud is the earliest discovery of Middle Stone Age tools in northern Africa, it is not the only one. Benzu Cave, also in Morocco, has a set of tools similar to those at Jebel Irhud, dated to 250,000 years ago. Farther to the east, a site in the desert of Egypt and a site called Sai Island on the Nile River of Sudan both contain prepared core tools, dated to about 220,000 years ago. These sites suggest the presence of early Homo sapiens in northeastern Africa at this early date. Sai Island is especially interesting for a particular set of tools found there. Along typical Middle Stone Age tools, a tool called a core axe was very common. Core axes differ from the hand axes of the Acheulean in their shape and method of manufacture. Based on the presence of use wear on the core axes at Sai Island, they were inserted into a split piece of wood to be used as a handle. These heavy-duty tools may have served for woodworking or digging. Moving now to Eastern Africa, we find archaeological sites with clearly Middle Stone Age tools, probably made by early Homo sapiens, that are just as old as Jebel Irhud. Interestingly, people in Eastern Africa were making similar types of tools with similar techniques as people in Northern Africa. For example, in southern Kenya, in the Rift Valley, Middle Stone Age tools have been found in several sites in the Olorgesailie Basin. One of the archaeological layers at this site was dated to 320,000 years ago, and within it, there is a complete absence of large Acheulean tools and a dominance of thin flakes made into scrapers and points about 5 centimeters long. As in northern Africa, High-quality, fine-grained rocks seem to have been preferred. At Olorgesailie, it was not flint, but the black volcanic glass called obsidian, used for at least 7% of the tools and at some sites up to 50%. Other sites in eastern Africa 
reveal that early Homo sapiens toolkits were becoming more multifaceted. Two remarkable sites in the Rift Valley contain a record of increasing complexity during the transition from Acheulean to Middle Stone Age. First, at Kapthurin Geological Formation in central Kenya, archaeological layers that range between 500 and 200,000 years old contain a mix of large hand axes and prepared cores. In the lower, older layers, large cutting tools were dominant and prepared core technology only sporadically used. By about 285,000 years ago, small flake tools such as scrapers and points had become more common than Acheulean tools. Not only do the tools decrease in size in more recent layers, but there is also more use of fine-grained rock, a wider range of techniques used to produce tools, and more diversity in the final shapes. Further to the north, in the Rift Valley of Ethiopia, at a site called Galemota, a similar pattern is observed. In a layer dated to 279,000 years ago, over 4,900 pieces of stone tools, cores, and debris, almost all made from obsidian, were unearthed. Again, we find the typical Middle Stone Age points and scrapers, among other shapes. No large cutting tools were found. As at Capthurin, more Levallois cores and a wider diversity of tool shape are found in younger chronological layers. This sequence demonstrates that hominins, probably early Homo sapiens, were finding more uses for a wider variety of tools and becoming more technically skilled tool makers. Southern Africa contains a similar chronological sequence to that seen in Eastern Africa. Before 300,000 years ago, mostly hand axes were used, alongside occasional scrapers and points. But after 300,000 years ago, sites start to appear that have few or no Acheulean tools. This shift is especially well documented at Kathu Pan, South Africa, a marshland where one of the layers containing Middle Stone Age points, scrapers, and Levallois cores, along with a wide variety of animal bones, such as zebra, rhinoceros, wildebeest, and buffalo, is dated to 291,000 years ago. The makers of these tools apparently hunted or scavenged meat from these animals drawn to the wetland. Mixed with the typical Middle Stone Age tools are a few blades. Blades are the name given by archaeologists to stone tools that are twice as long as they are wide, usually with the long edges being parallel to each other. This type of tool began to appear sporadically in eastern and southern Africa as early as 400,000 years ago, the same time that the first prepared cores and points were invented. Blades require sophisticated core preparation to produce consistently and are an efficient way of making cutting edge from a stone. Blades will become the dominant stone tool type later in human prehistory. However, early Homo sapiens didn't choose to make them very often. Florisbad, an especially interesting site in South Africa, has archaeological remains dated to 279,000 years ago. I mentioned Florisbad in the last episode as a source of an early Homo sapiens skull. In addition to the human skull, stone tools made with prepared cores, charcoal, and animal bones have been found here. These tools don't include any Acheulean hand axes. Some of the animal bones were burned and were from various species of antelope, zebra, and even hippos. This suggests that this site was used to butcher and cook these animals, which had probably been hunted when they came to the nearby spring. Based on these discoveries from the north, east, and south of the continent, archaeologists often notice that the shape of the tools is not very consistent during the first 150,000 years of the Middle Stone Age. While most early Homo sapiens were using prepared cores, the shapes of the points, scrapers, and blades varied within a site. This is unlike more recent human societies, from which archaeologists can identify the location and time period of a specific culture based on very precise characteristics of the stone tools. 
maybe enough sites haven't yet been discovered from the Middle Stone Age to discern patterns in tools across this vast period. However, some experts argue that the lack of regional uniformity is evidence that humans during this period were not behaviorally modern because they were not yet transferring ideas between them and creating lasting traditions in their ways of life as represented by their tools. While this might be true, there is one fascinating exception to the inconsistency of tool shape near the beginning of the Middle Stone Age. This brings us to the last stop on our tour of the continent. Central Africa, covered today mostly by tropical forest, is home to the style of stone tools known as Lupemban, named after the site in the Democratic Republic of Congo where it was first discovered. Lupemban tools are characterized by long, thin, beautifully crafted stone points that look like daggers. These tools, which are longer than 10 centimeters, have been found across Central Africa, especially in the Congo River Basin. Exactly what they were used for is unclear. Along with these iconic daggers, early Homo sapiens in the region also made typical Middle Stone Age tools using prepared cores, along with core axes like those from Sai Island in Sudan. Due to the geological traits of this region, it had not been possible to convincingly date any of the dozens of sites that had these types of tools until 2010, when a site at the southern edge of the Congo Basin in Zambia was successfully dated to between 270 and 230,000 years ago. If this age is representative of other Lupemban sites, this would be the first clearly distinctive regional style in prehistoric tools and might be evidence of the formation of a unique culture near the start of the Middle Stone Age. Even more interesting is the theory proposed by some that the Lupemban tools are a specific adaptation to lifestyles in the rainforest of Central Africa. In fact, no Acheulean tools have been found in this region, possibly making the makers of the Lupemban tools the earliest hominins to colonize the rainforest. This hypothesis has been heavily criticized based on the argument that hunter-gatherers, even in the recent past, have difficulty surviving in this ecosystem. These experts argue that the Lupemban tools may have been used during climatically dry periods when the rainforest had receded. However, since we only have one securely dated site, we can't make definitive conclusions yet about the climatic associations of the Lupemban tools. Unfortunately, we have very little information about the hominin populations in Central and Western Africa during the Middle Stone Age due to a lack of securely dated archaeological sites. It is assumed that these areas were at least partially inhabited by hominins, including early Homo sapiens, and that the lack of information mostly stems from a lack of research in Western Africa and the difficulty of dating sites in Central Africa. Having now concluded this ancient archaeological tour, let's see what it can tell us about the origin of our species. First, the adoption of smaller, hafted stone tools happened all across the African continent at roughly the same time. We don't have enough dated archaeological sites or dates that are precise enough to determine the heartland of the Middle Stone Age, or to figure out what direction this technology spread. But we can say that early Homo sapiens were living in northern, eastern, and southern Africa by 290,000 years ago. Whether the use of prepared cores was spread between already existing populations of early Homo sapiens, or whether migrating people brought the technology is impossible to say. What we do know is that these Middle Stone Age tools were continuously used for more than 100,000 years without drastic changes. The next significant developments in stone tool technology will not arrive until the wet period starting around 128,000 years ago. This stagnation has been used by some archaeologists to argue that people at this time were not as cognitively sophisticated as modern humans. It's true that we see much more rapid turnover in tool styles 
among later prehistoric cultures. Our tour of Africa also tells us about the lifestyle of early Homo sapiens. As we have seen, this new Middle Stone Age toolkit was smaller, more portable, more diverse, and more adaptable than Acheulean tools. Early Homo sapiens might have become more mobile and relied more on technology than other hominins. Smaller tools were easier to carry with them wherever they went. Acheulean tools are usually found very close to the source of the stone used to make them, whereas Middle Stone Age tools were often moved dozens of kilometers from their source. Keeping these tools with them longer probably also encouraged them to make better tools out of better raw materials like chert, flint, and obsidian. Finally, the greater variety of types probably indicates that they were using tools for a wider range of tasks than before, with tools that were specialized by function. Our species was starting to make greater use of the resources at their disposal. Some archaeologists argue that the Middle Stone Age toolkit was designed in part to hunt animals with projectile weapons, starting with thrown spears. This theory is based on the fact that many of these points seem to be designed in a way that would make them ideal weapons, in that they are aerodynamic, have sharp points to puncture the prey, long cutting edges to cause substantial bleeding, and are suitable for attachment to a spear shaft. The most concrete early evidence for point use as thrown spears comes from Ethiopian points from Galimota, dated to 279,000 years ago, and which have fractures consistent with impact damage from thrown spears. However, not all archaeologists are convinced that early Homo sapiens were hunting with projectile weapons so early in prehistory, based on such sparse evidence. Insights into human hunting strategies also come from an examination of the animals early Homo sapiens were eating. Luckily for us, animal bones found in the same archaeological layers as Acheulean and Middle Stone Age tools have survived. The Middle Stone Age bones show fewer carnivore bite marks and more scratches made by stone tools than in the Acheulean period. So early Homo sapiens were probably more adept hunters and relying less on scavenging meat from animals killed by carnivores. However, surprisingly, the species and size of animals eaten by early Homo sapiens doesn't seem to change at the start of the Middle Stone Age. So while humans may have been hunting more, it's unclear if new tools were changing their hunting strategies. While we tend to talk a lot about hunting because we have direct evidence of it in the form of animal bones, we should also realize that prehistoric people must have also eaten considerable amounts of plant food. Obtaining all daily calories from meat is known to be extremely unhealthy for our species, so prehistoric people probably spent as much time foraging for fruits, nuts, and tubers as they did hunting. As a postscript to our tour of the Middle Stone Age of Africa, we should briefly mention stone tool developments in Eurasia. While there's no evidence of Homo sapiens living in Eurasia 300,000 years ago, there is evidence that prepared core technology was being used by our evolutionary cousins, the Neanderthals. Amazingly, they seem to have stopped using large cutting tools, like hand axes, and adopted Levallois prepared cores and small tools like scrapers around the same time that early Homo sapiens were making the same transition in Africa. Many archaeologists think that the Levallois method was invented independently by Homo sapiens in Africa and Neanderthals in Europe. However, it is possible that we taught them how to make prepared core tools, or that they taught us. Contacts between these two species probably occurred in the Levant during the Middle Stone Age. Also, it's been shown that Neanderthals adopted technologies from Homo sapiens much later in prehistory. Whether Neanderthals learned to make these tools on their own or from us, it's powerful evidence of their intelligence and dexterity.
The wind gently blew over the central African savanna. At the mouth of a cave on a hilltop, an old woman sat next to a pile of reddish-purplish stones. They had been brought to her by different members of her family from across the landscape. Carefully, she examined each stone, turning them over in her hands and setting aside those with the appropriate texture and most vibrant color. Years of experience had taught her the difference between good ochre pieces and useless ones. Once satisfied with the quality of a particular piece of ochre, she bent down onto her knees in front of a large flat stone and ground the rock into a fine red powder. A fistful of this red dust was mixed with water until it reached the right consistency. She used a finger to draw a line on a stone next to her and confirmed that the paint was ready. Calling to her son, she beckoned him over. He dutifully kneeled in front of the old woman so that she could paint red lines across his face and chest. With a proud look on her face, she told him that he was now ready for the day's hunt. 300,000 years ago, the application of colorful pigments among our ancestors may reflect an emerging awareness and deliberate manipulation of symbolic meaning. They were developing new ways of communicating and expressing, which would have ramifications for the evolution of social interactions between early Homo sapiens. To conclude today's episode, we will take a look at some archaeological evidence that is neither stone tools nor animal bones. Here, we can glean some valuable views into early Homo sapiens behavior. First, by the Middle Stone Age, early Homo sapiens probably were able to make and control fire for cooking, warmth, and protection from predators. Fire made it safer for them to inhabit caves which are often the domain of dangerous carnivores. Documented use of fire by hominins goes back more than a million years to Homo erectus. However, the use of naturally occurring wildfires is not the same thing as starting a fire. It is nearly impossible to have concrete evidence of fire creation, and so it's difficult for archaeologists to pinpoint the time period when humans became the masters of fire. However, there's general agreement that by the Middle Stone Age, humans had this ability, based on the frequent evidence of fire alongside Middle Stone Age tools, such as charcoal, ash, and burnt bones. For example, the site of Florisbad preserved a patch of ash, a cluster of charcoal, and burnt bones from 279,000 years ago. Many other Middle Stone Age sites possess similar evidence of fire. The ability to cook food is theorized to have facilitated the increase in brain size observed in archaic hominins, because less energy is required by the body to digest cooked than raw food. The leftover calories can then be devoted to a larger brain, which requires a lot of energy to function. Aside from the nutritional benefits of fire, it also impacted the social life of human groups. By creating a focal point for social interaction, campfires may have facilitated and encouraged communication and bonding. We have no way of knowing for sure at what point hominins started using spoken language, but many anthropologists believe that some form of language existed by the time modern brain sizes developed with Homo heidelbergensis, even if it was not as complex as the language used by modern humans. By the Middle Stone Age, Homo sapiens possessed the necessary anatomy of the larynx and the ear to both produce and hear the range of sounds in modern languages. In addition, archaeologists point to the increasingly complex technologies of the Middle Stone Age as products of brains that must have had the ability to use language. So groups of early Homo sapiens probably sat around campfires talking about their hunting adventures and the best places to find certain plants. Aside from bonding around a campfire, humans engaged in another new activity, painting. At the start of the Middle Stone Age, the use of colorful pigments starts to become common. The evidence for this is the presence of pigment stones 
necessary to make paint. Across Africa, the typical material used for pigment was red ochre. These stones show signs of grinding and scratching on their surfaces to produce powder. The exact purpose of ochre powder during this time is highly debated by archaeologists, but it's clear that these rocks were valuable since people were collecting them and transporting them across the landscape. For example, at the Twin Falls site in Zambia, pieces of ochre with evidence of grinding were brought to that site from 5 to 22 kilometers away. These rocks were a purplish-reddish color and seem to have been preferred over other colors that were found closer by. Ochre has also been found in the Kenyan sites of Olorga Sile and Kapthurin. At Sai Island in Sudan, pigments were processed by using grinding stones. All of these sites date to before 200,000 years ago. While these cases are not the earliest evidence of ochre use, which goes back to the early Stone Age, it seems that the Middle Stone Age marks an expansion of ochre use based on its increasing frequency at archaeological sites. But what does it mean? Some archaeologists see it as the first evidence of symbolic behavior by early Homo sapiens. These experts suggest that they were using the pigment to paint their bodies or their clothing to communicate something about themselves to other people, such as membership in a certain social group. This behavior would indicate the ability to create a meaning for some otherwise arbitrary sign, and would represent a new cognitive ability called abstract thinking. Contrary to this hypothesis, other archaeologists point out that ochre has been demonstrated to have more functional purposes, such as a sunscreen or as a material for the preservation of animal skins. This argument is made by those who think that humans did not achieve modern levels of cognitive sophistication until much more recently. While it certainly is possible that ochre was used for merely functional purposes, it seems noteworthy that early Homo sapiens paid close attention to the shade of red ochre being used. For example, at Pinnacle Point Cave on the coast of South Africa, 160,000 years ago, only the brightest red ochre stones were ground into powder, while the duller ones were collected but left unused. This type of color selection is seen at other sites and suggests symbolic use. The appearance of the Middle Stone Age throughout Africa coincides in an interesting way with our genetic and fossil history. The most recent common ancestor of all living humans is estimated to have lived between 300 and 150,000 years ago. In other words, at some time during the early Middle Stone Age. So a population of early Homo sapiens living somewhere in Africa, making Levallois points, carrying spears, hunting gazelle and antelope, cooking the meat over a fire, and painting themselves with ochre gave rise to all of us living today. There probably were many other similar populations living across Africa during this period, to whom we are not directly related, as those lineages went extinct. We don't know whether it was the people making tools in Morocco, Sudan, Kenya, Zambia, or the Congo Basin who are the direct ancestors of those of us living today. As we saw in the last episode, genetics has given us clues, but no definitive answers. One question left for us to ponder is if we were to travel back in time and meet one of these people with large protruding brows and low foreheads, would we recognize them as fully human? Does the ability to make fire, levallois stone tools, and stone-tipped spears mean that they had a modern level of intelligence? Does the use of paint demonstrate a symbolic mode of thinking that is indicative of the ability to use complex language? Maybe it does, but if they were as smart as us, we are left to ask, why didn't they develop technologically more quickly? Why didn't they make art, which has yet to be found from this period? Why didn't they migrate out of Africa like their descendants did tens of thousands of years later? In our next episode, we will explore the warming continent of Africa after 128,000 years ago. 
people will develop cultural traditions and reach new creative milestones. This has been Our Prehistory. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider visiting this podcast Patreon page and becoming a monthly contributor so that I can continue bringing you Our Prehistory.